I'm here today not as a scholar so much, but as a very weary civilian activist. Perhaps I'm really a character trapped in George Orwell's imagination. It feels that way sometimes. Can everyone hear me? I've been exposing racism. That's what anti-Semitism is. But when I have, the world's anti-racists, often self-appointed, accused me of being a racist or an Islamophobe. Now, I'm a radical feminist, I'm an academic, I'm an independent thinker, and a member of that dying breed of civil libertarians who believe in universal human rights. I am not a multicultural relativist, and nor do I write incomprehensibly in a postmodern Mandarin style. I am certainly no follower of Edward Said or the post-colonial academy, which has brought about the Palestinianization of intellectual reality, and that has labeled to transfer the global battle against real apartheid in South Africa that existed to Israel, where apartheid doesn't really exist. I rose to international prominence in the early 1970s as the author of best-selling books that were translated into many languages. I only became impressed when it was in Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. The European languages, okay. And I've been for 30 years, nearly, I was a professor of psychology and of women's studies. Everything that Charles said is true. Now, I, from the start, I was troubled about Jew hatred from the early 1970s on, but I didn't make it the primary focus of my work. Um, I encountered anti-Semitism among left and lesbian feminists, which is why I visited Israel for the first time. And after that, I did many things. I tried to persuade leading feminists to sign the petitions which opposed the Zionism equals racism resolution at the UN. And I co-sponsored all kinds of Jewish feminist conferences and rituals, and I'm privileged to be one of the leaders of a legendary struggle in Jerusalem, in which I have been a named plaintiff against the state of Israel and the Rabbanut on behalf of Jewish women's religious rights. This should give me credit, but it doesn't. <laughs> um, I was also known back in the day as a pro-peace activist. It's true, I was. and I publicly opposed for maybe 15 years the alleged occupation of the disputed territories. And um, I once lived in the Muslim world. I moved with Muslims in the Muslim world and with Arabs. I was a very trendy Jew, assimilated <laughs> and secular and pro-Muslim and pro-Arab, which I still am, by the way. I also worked for the United Nations in 1980. And that's an education unto itself. And I was at the conference in Copenhagen, which was supposed to be about women, but turned very rapidly into a carefully programmed and choreographed Soviet, Iranian, Arab League, Palestinian psychological pogrom against Jews and the Jewish state, mainly against Israel. And at this conference, I had the pleasure of meeting Mina Ben Svi, who's even shorter than I am, but was the commander of Penn the Women's Armed Forces in Israel in 1948. And she couldn't believe what was happening, and she asked me despairingly, I thought, we were done with it, is it back? Well, indeed, yes, it is. And at the time, I immediately flew to Israel, and I initiated some very important meetings, which led nowhere. I was interviewed on the front pages of all the leading newspapers on the subject, uh, but many Israelis, this is 1980, didn't think anti-Semitism was their problem. They, they really didn't. It was interesting conversations. And when I returned to America, I addressed a number of, made privately, a number of major Jewish organizations. And I said, there's a propaganda war coming down the pike against the Jews and against the West and against white people and against all Western values that we care about and that Jewish organizations especially need to work on combating the very big laws. I said that we need to train the coming generations in the politically correct language of oppression and liberation. 
And we also needed to understand Islam, said I, 1980. And I got a very respectful hearing, which led nowhere. And I thought it's because I'm a girl. No, in the 1990s, a male colleague told me that he approached American Jewish organizations with a similar request, and it led nowhere. So in retrospect, the Jews lost 30 good years in terms of combating the propaganda against us. I take some responsibility for this. I was unable and unwilling to devote myself day and night, a la Herzl, to this thankless and life-threatening task. I told people he was dead in a decade and I didn't want to die. But all the Jewish organizations who heard me speak after the Copenhagen Conference and the Israeli government ministers who I met with they share in this responsibility. In 1982, I visited a bunch of synagogues all over Europe, and they were all under heavily armed police protection, which was so sad because of a wave of bombings, which continues to this day. And I had a literary agent, and I said, I, I want to do a book about this now. And he said that he wouldn't represent such a work because it wasn't true. <laughs> oh, if only he had been right. So I did nothing. That means I wrote nothing, which is what I do, until the beginning of the 21st century. I was deeply, deeply shaken by Arafat's carefully planned intifada of 2000. Remember the two Israeli reservists who were lynched in Ramallah? And that bloody, heartless footage was shown everywhere, over and over again, by media personalities who displayed no emotion, no affect, who did not describe this as a lynching or as barbarism or as racism. And then I knew that the bloody beast was bad and that I would have to say so. I also saw how quickly the Muhammad al dura blood libel went viral and became a rallying cry, an icon on t-shirts and mugs and flags and placards and suddenly the propaganda war against the Jews and against the truth dominated the world stage. And this included photos and would soon include, would, would include fictionalized documentaries about massacres that the Israelis never committed. Then 9-11 tore a hole through history in my own city. And the pathologically anti-Jewish and anti-Zionist and anti-Christian and anti-American pronouncements of Osama bin Laden Confirmed that I would be responding to a great evil. The theme and the mission had claimed me, dare I say, had chosen me. And I, didn't, I said, no, no, I didn't want any bush to burn in front of me. I didn't want like, God to get involved in this. But I did have a sense that there were a number of us who began as if we'd been called, you know? because nobody was asking us to do this, and nobody was funding us for doing it. So in 2001, 2002, I wrote that in part, anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism, and that a perfect storm was underway, coming to us from the Islamic world, which had for centuries periodically persecuted, murdered, taxed, and finally exiled, at least 750,000 to 850,000 Jews, and from the politically correct, anti-colonial, multicultural, relativist ideology, which increasingly dominated the Western intelligentsia, including in Israel. So I published this book in 2003, The New Anti-Semitism. Not a perfect book. I wrote it in white heat. And I got into very big trouble. I lost cherished friends and colleagues. But at the end of the day, I got written up in the Encyclopedia Judaica, which impressed the hell out of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I developed a whole new set of allies. And my life changed course. The book received one very negative review in the mainstream media, and this was a place that had reviewed my 10th book on the front page of the book world, very, very positively. And 
The major media reviewed a few other books that came out at the same time, three, four months after mine. One that totally failed to note that there was a lethal Jew hatred coming from the Islamic world and was on the internet and on Al Jazeera. Didn't notice that. This was the book written by Abe Foxman who gets 50 to 75 million dollars a year from the American Jews. I rest my case before I even make it. So, but being disappeared in progressive and mainstream circles was a new experience for me. Uh, and so was another fact, which was the first time in my career the conservative media embraced my work and said very poignant, touching things. The one reviewer said, well, if it comes down to it, if I have to be in the trench with a radical feminist, if she's fighting the same battle I am, then so be it. And I, they must have killed her <laughs> to come to this conclusion. <clears throat> Thereafter, <coughs> when I spoke about anti-Semitism, Israel, the West, Enlightenment values, the Judeo-Christian tradition, and about Islamic gender and religious apartheid on campuses, I needed uh, police protection. I came to call this phenomenon uh, Gaza on the Hudson, or on the West Coast, Gaza on the Pacific. And my first near riot, my son was a witness to, and he's here. I gave a lecture, student initiated a conference, very good, very nice, at Barnard. And they loved every word I said. I loved their applause and their cheers and their laughter. And then one woman, an Asian provocateur, stood up and said, we demand to know where you stand on the issue of the women of Palestine. And I could have ducked it. I could have said, I like candles for them. I'm with them. I said, I believe what, what you're asking me is, where do I stand on the issue of apartheid? And I oppose it. And the largest practitioner of both gender and religious apartheid in the world today is Islam. The place went crazy. The place went crazy. That was my first experience, and others have, and I, I wasn't going to write about it because this was a feminist conference, so I placed eight phone calls to the organizers of the conference. I said, what just happened now is very significant. Please get back to me. Maybe we should issue a joint statement. But they never got back to me, so I wrote about it. It went viral and, and maybe woke up some more people. Okay, so I was just at the point where a major Jewish honcho mocked me as the Jewish Cassandra. And I didn't want to be Cassandra, Jewish or otherwise. No one listened to her, and her people were murdered, and their civilization destroyed. Did this major player forget his classics? The fact that I was publishing now mainly at conservative websites made my and newspapers made my feminist cohort feel unsafe, quote unquote. I was challenged on my support for Israel all the time, called a Zionist bitch and a lot worse. Now what have I learned in the last, and these were feminists who I did important struggles with. These are not just nobodies who I don't care about, I care about them. So what have I learned in the last 12 years? Has it changed my behavior? Well, have I given up or gotten angrier or more pessimistic or more despairing? Well, no. Despite a lot of fatigue and frustration and outrage and boredom and social and economic punishment, I'm still speaking out, even though I do not believe that my or our work can divert disaster in time. The disaster has already taken place. I am only talking about the war of ideas. I am not talking about Israel's or America's ability to survive militarily or economically even. But our traditions are in danger. At this moment, compared to most of the surrounding Arab and increasingly Islamist regimes, Israel is doing very well. Its scientists continue to invent amazing cures for illnesses. Its Silicon Valley, military and anti-terrorism security savvy is one of the finest in the world, and it's a much desired export. The discovery of gas and oil may turn Israel into a major energy power within a decade or two. Israel does have a free press. <laughs> I, 
uh, and it, a branch of which specializes in criticizing Israel day and night, for which we must be grateful. Okay. Um, so Israel has a free press and a feminist and a gay rights movement, and it has <coughs> filmmakers, gatekeeper filmmakers, journalists, writers, and academics who blame Israel relentlessly and Israel only. But in Israel, none of these critics of Israel are arrested, really, or tortured, or murdered, or driven into exile, as are their Arab counterparts when they stand against real tyranny. It's true, Jews argue nonstop with each other, but we're not engaged as Syria is in a hot military civil war, in a terrorist <laughs> war. But we have lost the war of ideas. Israel is now utterly defamed. It is seen as the very worst country on earth. It's the symbol for white colonialism, imperialism, ethnic cleansing. It's a Nazi apartheid regime. Now, I wrote about this in the new anti-Semitism. I didn't know anything back then. Now there's been a quantum leap forward in blood libels in every language on earth, and Israel's essential evil is intoned 24-7 around the globe, overtly, blatantly, subtly, and relentlessly. Beloved and distinguished artists, Nobel Prize winners, well, they gave a Nobel Prize to Arafat, so Nobel Prize winners, <laughs> and intellectuals, <laughs> No, I, I could go further, but I'm not going to. Um, and the prize has no value anymore. Uh, so beloved and distinguished artists and intellectuals continue to sign petitions against Israel. Not against the Sudan. It's amazing. Not against Egypt. It's extraordinary. Not against Syria. And they board these freedom flotillas, that's Orwellian, to a misogynist Hamas-controlled Gaza. Muslim world and Western world cartoonists continue to publish Nazi-style cartoons of Jews and Zionists with impunity. Because after all, Jews don't riot, firebomb, shoot, or behead people whose ideas are offensive, hateful, and endangering. And I'm not suggesting that Jews or Americans become barbarians. I am pointing out, though, how Jewish nonviolence and other ethical and psychological virtues are used against us. Now, how could we be winning the war of ideas? Well, we can't, because we've only just recently begun to fight it. And it's very late in the day. And we face a tsunami of hatred. Now, here are some examples. Cairo. Our heroes are stationed on the border, awaiting a signal to fall upon Israel and deliver the fatal blow that will bring about her end. Jordan. We will liquidate Israel completely so that she will disappear from the face of the earth. Jordan again. It would appear on the face of it that the concentration of the Jews in the occupied region, Israel, militates in favor of Zionism. But in the long run, it will favor the Arab nation because this will turn Israel into one huge worldwide grave for the whole Jewish concentration. These are broadcasts and publications appeared in 1960, 1961, and 1963. And at that time, there were no disputed territories. East Jerusalem was not yet in Israeli hands. So Tel Aviv was always the settlement in the crosshairs of hatred. As we know, the Palestinian leaders I'm not saying that the people are not victimized by their leaders and that their suffering is not real. But the Palestinian leaders have rejected a separate state of their own many times because their aim is to destroy the Jewish state and have one state, a state, listen carefully, that is ethnically cleansed of Jews. Look at the Arab Middle East. It is utilized, cleansed of Jews. And it is well on its way to ethnically cleansing its Christians as well. And today, all the good people believe that Arab Muslims and Arab Christians should be able to live in democratic Israel, and they do and should, but that Jewish Israelis should not be able to live in Gaza or on the West Bank, also known as Judea and Samaria. This is crazy, if you think about it, if you care about ethnic cleansing. 
those who are demonizing Israel are saying Israel is ethnically cleansing when in fact this is what their history is and what their aim currently is. If I could not say this in most places, if I did, there would be a, a big hubbub. So what, and by the way, I don't have a scholar's position on the military value of this settlement here versus that settlement, not there. It just seems that Jews should be able to live where they want to live, right? Without being killed. Not to mention everyone else, especially Hindus. So what else have I learned in the last decade? Well, I learned something I should have known but didn't, which is that telling the truth, which I value a lot, leads to real punishment. And how naive I was to think that academics and human rights activists would stand by truth tellers in dangerous times. I'm looking at Charles, he's looking at me. From 2004 to 2012, I must have written more than 100 articles each and every year on this subject and 200 more on the related subjects of terrorism, anti-Americanism, the proliferation of big lies on campus, and in the media, and about Islamic gender and religious apartheid. I'm tired. These days, I own, and there are others now who are doing this work. These days, I only write when something is so outrageous, so surreal, that I cannot help myself. And others, thankfully, are doing the daily deep trench work of exposing the biases and the outright blood libels that come our way every day, minute by minute, and every hour of every day. And only the wicked or the delusional deny that there has been a worldwide rise in virulent Jew hatred and anti-Semitism. Somebody last night said, well, it's not so bad. <laughs> a smart fellow. And that anti-Zionism, it's okay to criticize Israel. That doesn't mean you're anti-Semitic. I invited him to come. So yes, the Jews are in danger all over Europe. Jews are hostage in Iran, maybe 30, 35,000 more or less, not allowed to leave in uh, Khomeini's clutches. But the Jews are safe in America, not on campuses, not with certain points of view. But according to one recent survey, a poll, and you know, can we trust it? I'm not sure. Um, there was a poll that showed us that more than 70 million adult Americans believe that American Jews are more loyal to Israel than to America. I don't know of any polls about dual loyalty among Italian Americans. Are they loyal to America or to the Vatican? Are Muslim Americans loyal to Sharia law or to the American Constitution? Maybe we're safe here. But the Jews in Israel are less so. I believe what the Iranian leaders say, and they wish to exterminate Israel. They say so all the time. In 2004, I compared the percent of Israeli civilians murdered and wounded with their demographic American equivalent. Would have been 30,000 to 50,000 dead Americans. And all wounded would have numbered more than 200,000 9-11 was 3,000 of our dead, and we went to war. I'm not sure we declared it. Sure. The body count, this body count, was precisely why Israel built the security wall. And it worked. And of course, it was quickly dubbed the apartheid Nazi wall, and Israel was castigated for daring to defend herself. And when Israel really does defend herself militarily, oh, hue and cry beyond belief. In 2004, I also published a piece in which I shared my concerns about a second Holocaust, which seems to me was beginning to begin in Israel proper. And I published it in a right-wing Orthodox Zionist newspaper. And I am a firebrand feminist, but I was smeared, I mean, okay, as the worst kind of neoconservative, the worst kind of Christian conservative, okay. The price that one pays for exposing the genocidal intentionality of today's anti-Semitism, and as my colleague 
Richard Landis would say, for challenging the lethal narratives can be very high. Exposing the nature of Islamic gender and religious apartheid and Islamist terrorism against the West and against civilians and against Muslims first is a very dangerous preoccupation. Everyone saw that Lars Hedegaard was shot at at point blank range in his home by somebody masked pretending to be a post office official, a mailman. Uh, Hedegaard lived. Uh, we can discuss this if, if it's of interest. Um, now those intellectuals who have exposed the long history of gender and religious apartheid in Arab and Muslim countries and the long history of Islamic imperialism, Islamic colonialism, and unapologetic slavery have been arrested, murdered, death threatened, forced to flee their homes, worse than they adopt pen names, and live with around-the-clock protection. And they have been defamed, sued, and impoverished via lawsuit, therefore silenced. <coughs> think of Salman Rushdie and think of Oriana Falachi, or Ayan Hirsi Ali, or, Al or Magdi Alam. And I can add 50 names to this list, and these are just people who I know personally. And that means that for everyone who really stands up to evil and tells truth to power, that old dictum, you're going to need to pay for a small personal bodyguard around the clock. Think of the cost of that, and think of the cost of not paying for it. Now, pro-Israel activists who use their own names, we have not been shot at. We've just been treated as pariahs in all our former circles of influence. Uh, we've been demonized and boycotted and attacked just the way Israel has been. And this has not deterred us from our truth-telling mission. And in fact, there are probably more articles and more books on anti-Semitism than there are living Jews. I compiled a list for us <laughs> of 61 books and then an enormous number of films post-2002, 2003, films and then grassroots groups, and then most wondrous of all, pro-Israel blog sites that have wonderful names like Chala Hu Akba. You got that? Chala Hu Akba. Ah, and so I have always believed that heroism is our only alternative, and I still do. But after 12 years on the front line, I was going to say on the firing line, and I have to admit the following, that one cannot fight and win such a war without money and power, without having, metaphorically speaking, boots, a gun, ammunition, food, and some esprit de corps. Thus the barefoot, grassroots, largely unfunded soldiers, our intellectual and cognitive warriors, have been at a disadvantage in the late 20th and 21st century. Those who were chosen, often against our will, didn't plan to make careers out of the subject and find ourselves, nevertheless, taking on a Sisyphean task and not being supported by the organizations that presumably represent us. I'm not even getting into the American government. If somebody raises it, we can discuss that. Now, Initially, a lot of our early work was not challenged, it was just disappeared. And then it was copied, borrowed by later comers with good pension plans. Because they finally needed to, that means American Jewish organizations who do very good things also. They needed to assure their funders that the problem of rising anti-Semitism on the campus and the world, they're handling it. They're on it. They got a solution. It's happening. And in my opinion, they were lying to themselves, to their funders, and the funders wanted to believe them. We have not really been supported by our people, 70% of whom are liberals, as, and I've been radical, beyond liberal. And we've been, I'm talking now about the war of ideas concerning Israel. And we've been joined by Christian evangelicals and conservative Christian conservatives with a strong love for Israel. And I hope that God blesses them for their support. I often get asked, how come the Jews are not really kicking ass? 
And now I have something very sorrowful to say back. How come the Coptic Church is not protecting its own? Okay, and so the answer is complicated. Because if you do something, if you raise a big stink in America, then Coptic Christians trapped in Egypt might get butchered in the next hour. So you have to be very careful how you do it. One cannot fight and win a war of ideas when one is not fighting it. And simultaneously, when the entire world is fighting uh, against us in this precise war of ideas, legally, economically, politically, militarily, academically, ideologically, and publicly. One cannot fight and win a war of ideas when some of one's own people, whom I dare not blame, are also part of the problem. Let me pause for a moment to say a few words about the problem that has no name. I have in the past written, spoken all about Jewish anti-Zionism and Jewish perfectionism vis-a-vis -vis Israel only, but I'm not any longer sure that the problem is really just one of self-hatred or even opportunism, although, of course, these are factors. I think that progressive Jews want to lead safe, productive, respectable, and happy lives. They do not want to be burdened with pariah status by taking up unpopular causes, such as the cause of Jewish survival and a Jewish Israel. Just as I could not take up Herzl's work in the 21st century, they do not want to take up the hard work and risk the punishment that I and so many others have endured. I will not call them cowards and I won't call them conformists for not doing so. I see them holding fast to their one comfortable and precious life and they genuinely do not understand the harm they may do when they choose Israel only and Israel first to criticize. They really don't know. The criticized Israel firsters may also be more terrified of a second Holocaust and of jihadic terrorism than I am. And to feel safe, to feel that they're going to be spared, they've chosen to act as if they're not in danger at all. They are so safe that they can afford to care about the suffering of other people and not care about their own who are also in danger. And one of the things that may make Jews feel safe is that they have other Jews to blame, to condemn. It's the settlers, the Zionists, the conservatives, the right-wingers who are giving Israel and Judaism a bad name. But And make no mistake, right-wing pro-settler and religious Orthodox Jews are very bitter about the other Jews just as well. The godless, the secularists, the self-hating and the suicidal liberals, the feminists, the gays, and the peaceniks. Oh, I have just been through the most bruising encounter with an orthodox opponent of women of the wall. I mean, you can assume him. Yidin, as Jews, we have not caused the problem of anti-Semitism any more than women have caused the problem of sexism. If we change our behavior, if we pray more, if we refuse to pray at all, if we all convert to Buddhism, if we wear very short skirts or wear burqas, the anti-Semitism and the sexism, the sexism will still continue to flourish. Hidden, like women, and like despised and persecuted or oppressed people everywhere, we will have to band together to fight for our lives and our rights, or we will each die alone. In 2004, I publicly called for a meeting of the 12 tribes, but I didn't organize that meeting. And I used to joke that such a meeting would need one psychiatrist for every three Jews. Not because, <laughs> Jews, no, not because Jews are crazy, no, but because we would each threaten to walk out, not listen, refuse to stop yelling, etc. And I did not stop my life to undertake this work. For years, I have also called for a Jewish Al Jazeera, a worldwide internet, television, media, platform in every language whose beat is the entire world. And when the Middle East or Israel happens to come up, just the reportage is unbiased, without Jew hatred, 
so far no billionaire is approaching me or, or approaching the project or understanding the need to do it. Now there are two turning points, at least in America, in terms of the war of ideas. And I've written at length about both, and we can discuss them afterwards. And both took place in 2011, and I'm referring to the fracas that ensued when one, just one lone guy, a CUNY trustee, questioned an award to Tony Kushner, and the shameful dishonoring and forced departure of Dr. Charles Small, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism, from Yale. Dr. Small was told to evacuate the premise because he dared focus on Jew hatred in the Islamic and, quote, Palestinian world. The Palestinians were exceptionally displeased, and the Jewish faculty jumped at the chance to, um, to be rid of a Jew who would dare to offend terrorists, tyrants, and cold-blooded killers. Think of that. Think of that. That's who you were offending. We have lost the campuses. We have lost the ideological high ground. And I am not sure how to get it back, absent a miracle. I think that Dr. Small's decision to open, so to speak, on four campuses simultaneously is brilliant. But we know it's not the same thing as having students who are absolutely required to take the course year after year, semester after semester in one place. They've got to do it. They've got to hear it. They have to hear the whole truth, nothing but the truth. We know that European Jews are either leaving in droves or attending Jewish schools together with everyone of any other faith and praying in synagogues behind heavily guarded gates with major police protection all over Europe. And they're also keeping a very low profile, especially in England hoping the dreadful times will pass. A friend of mine, Gloria Greenfield, who has done two very important films, told me that she was in um, South Africa and that Israel has strong support from the Zulu nation. <laughs> no, bear this in mind, this is interesting. Now, all right, so the European Jews are leaving Europe. And Islamists are also killing Christians all over the Arab Middle East and in Central Asia, in Pakistan. And the various churches are not standing up to this ethnic or religious cleansing. And Islamists are also murdering local and foreign doctors and aid workers who are inoculating children against polio. We are dealing with barbarism and very radical evil. What I am about to say is the received wisdom, but it needs to be repeated in every generation. Evil always triumphs when good people do not stand up to it. Some Muslims, ex-Muslims, are standing up to Islamism, both in the West and in the Muslim world, but many more are needed, like the Germans, Austrians, Poles, and French in the Nazi era, who may have privately disagreed with Hitler's policies, that's not enough. It didn't save 11 million people. One must actively resist the devil or the devil wins. Christian Zionists are also standing up for Jews in Israel whom they love for religious reasons. I wish Jews could learn from them <laughs> to love each other. They cannot understand why Jews don't fight back more aggressively, why Jews are on the defensive, not the offensive. They're right, but there's also some good news. When I started this journey, I was pretty much alone. Now there are ever so many more committed and sophisticated and brilliant and tech-savvy and younger and truth-telling pro-Israel bloggers and filmmakers who have begun to coast the curve of the lethal narrative against Jewish Israel and against Western civilization. The two go together. And they are tireless. And mainstream newspapers have been forced to apologize and offer small print corrections more and more. Um, we're also all very concerned with the Islamistification of the American government. And this may be one reason I could be wrong why some of our best pro-Israel bloggers use the pen names. Yid with Lid, Elder of Zion, Emmet, um, Daladamos. Does everybody know what that is? I love it. 
It's an Aramaic term from the Talmud, and it refers to a measure of personal space in the universe and or to the amount of space that God occupies in the universe. Like me, many of the pro-Israel truth tellers, of course I include Charles in this, are all turning out work by the skin of our teeth, and they are the heroes of this historical hour, and our destiny may depend upon their work. Most of us take no salary, and often have to beg for operating expenses. But in my opinion, this very valiant work has not yet made any difference. Exposing the naked emperor has not stopped the parade of Israel apartheid and Palestine solidarity and BDS weeks on American and European campuses. And it hasn't stopped the steady flow of toxic propaganda in the Arab and Muslim media. And it hasn't come to the UN. It has not affected American diplomacy. So the lies stand. Now, I was trained to think psychoanalytically. And Sigmund Freud is a great thinker. And he understood so much, some would say everything, about human nature. And he accepted, he wasn't American, he accepted evil and tragedy as a normal part of the human condition. Even Freud was very reluctant to leave his beloved Vienna. He waited until it was almost too late and was then only able to escape at the last moment through his extraordinary relationship with former patients, such as Princess Marie Bonaparte. If Freud could not bear to leave all that was familiar, what can we now expect of more optimistic and less philosophical Jews in Europe? Dare I say, Jews in Israel. The Muslim world is on fire the Muslim on Muslim violence is so extreme and chaos and human suffering is so severe that in my opinion, Israel may have for a moment, a nanosecond, partly been knocked off the front pages as the absolute worst nation in the world. And as a Jew, I do not rejoice in the suffering of those who wish to kill me. We have to notice that the media is not yet demonizing Assad. It's quite amazing or Morsi in Egypt. Neither the Afghan or the Sudanese or the Syrian refugee has ever replaced, not yet, the Palestinian as the world's most important, most beloved, best funded refugee. Despite everything, I've been privileged to serve the truth and my people and my country and women worldwide in an era in which Genghis Khan has nuclear weapons and is willing to die in order to kill as many civilians as possible, in order to terrorize and intimidate the entire world, I have served with an extraordinary number of others who have been also chosen to do this work. As we know, we are all each obligated to do such work as long as we are alive, in our own historical moments. We're not obligated to complete it. As has been said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to act. Not to act is to act. That's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Thanks for your tireless work. And uh, you go from strength to strength. To Thank the, you. We need your voice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, being so uh, personal about the narrative. And I'm very interested um, in, in, in the details of your personal transformation. I mean, you gave a sketch of some sort, but, you know, um, I'm interested, you know, in, in, in your own personal uh, moments of, of real anguish that 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 really um, you, I suspect, or I shouldn't, that you must have experienced when you 
uh, were suddenly um, um, shunned by all your all the people that you marched with for decades. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I just, this, I, if you can tell us more about, I mean, this, you know, this because it's it's a mo it's a, it's a it's a very important moment that you know you suddenly something dawns. It doesn't happen, of course, suddenly. Well, no, no, no. Uh, it dawned in 1971 when, which is what sent me to Israel, and. On that trip, I met an Israeli who I married and had a son who's sitting next to you. So from that, that poisonous <laughs> fruit blossomed real fruits. I have granddaughters now. So I, in childhood, I was brought up as an Orthodox Jew in Borough Park. And I, at the age of eight, in 1948, on my own, I joined Hashemaya Hatzaiyah which my parents did not like one bit, and they called the rabbis down on me when I was nine to say, that is a godless communist organization. So I thought about it. I thought about it, and I joined Ein Harod, which was to the left. I was keen for liberation. I wanted, when they didn't give me a bat mitzvah, I was done with them for Ah. <laughs> so, I mean, I cared about Torah study, something that I do now. And it, there was no future for a girl in Borough Park in that time. So I was turned loose into the world. I fled it. But it's not as if I didn't have a background or a basis or a beginning of Judaism that burns within me. And as an intellectual, I'm heir to the Enlightenment. I'm heir to all the Western values and to the Judeo-Christian tradition. The fact that I married a Muslim and went to Afghanistan is another whole discussion. I mean, when I know how to rebel, I really know how to rebel. <laughs> but I found, I found, alas, um, that the women were in deeper trouble than what I had fled it was an important lesson. So that there were things brewing in me. There, there were, I had lived in Kabul and had moved in Muslim diplomatic circles for three years. And when I returned, when I escaped, when I got out, I kissed the ground at Idlewild Airport because I was back home in the land of libraries, is how I thought of it. Now, what that means is, as I said, I was a very trendy, assimilated kind of Jewish person, and at ease with many different cultures, and at my best with many different cultures. Feminism is something I didn't follow. I didn't learn about it. I helped create it. I'm one of the founders of the second wave of feminism. So, um, and that again was about liberation and liberation from oppression. I understood that America might not be perfect, but compared to Afghanistan, you know, we're good. We're good. I understood that early on. And many others don't understand that to this day. To this day. So when I encountered anti-Semitism, it was the raw, filthy kind in 71 among left feminists, a kind of Soviet era not just anti-Zionism, but a belief that Jews were pushy and smart and got ahead uh, by trickery and were sexier than everybody else. So, oh, I don't like how this sounds. Oh, no. So I went right to Israel for an overdue first trip. And I would have lived there. I loved it. It didn't work out. It didn't happen. So from that time on, though, I was not just working I was bringing journalists to Israel, including feminists, for the first time. I was one of the, the co-creators of the first ever Jewish, <coughs> Jewish feminist press conference to say, hey, we too are you know, women of color in a sense. And then we had a conference in New York at the McAlpin Hotel in 75, I think. Huge thousand people all speaking out. And then there was the feminist Seder, the Passover Seders and life cycle events that I helped create and that I was part of. So it's not as if I had forgot about being a Jew, ever. 
as I was moving in the feminist world. And I fought with people. And again, I stood in uh, Kikartzion, die Lucky Bush, die Lucky Bush with placards. That means enough with the occupation against the occupation. For me, and even in that period, I would fight with people about Israel. I would get challenged. Why do you care about that country? It's a horrible country. Or, but that's a country that discriminates. How can you justify it? I mean, that was happening, and I took it on. The turning point was the lynching in Ramallah, as I said. It really was. And many of the feminists and the leftists who in the beginning yelled at me and shunned me began to call me and whisper on the phone, you're so brave, you're right, I can't say what you're saying. Not everyone, certainly not everyone, but more and more. And I actually have gone out for the first time in 12 years recently into feminist company. I had a group of feminists in my home for dinner. I love these women. We knew what we couldn't talk about. We understood that there are things that cannot be discussed, and we all were careful. I mean, it's very weird to discover a fault line that becomes a chasm that opens beneath your feet, and you're about to topple into it existentially when people who you're either related to by blood or by marriage or by ideology suddenly take a sharp turn on you, against you. This is very weird stuff. And there are people sitting here, I recognize somebody who's here who left, somebody who's still here. This is part of the problem. This is part of the experience. So I can't say, oh, I hate those women, who cares about them? Oh, those, le those liberals, those leftists, I can't say that. I've been with them. And I uh, uh, believe in many of the values that they believe in. I still do. Once David Frum interviewed me on a radio program, and he said, what would the Phyllis Chesler of today say to the Phyllis Chesler of 1972 when Women in Madness came out? It was a good question. It really caught me off guard. And essentially, my answer was, I believe in a woman's right to abortion. No question. But what if that right becomes a piece of fluttering paper in the wind after we've been bombed back to the seventh century? So we have to pay attention to priorities and to the moment in history in which we live. Not everything is equal, not everything is the same, even though I think the two top feminist priorities lately, um, gay marriage and abortion, I agree, I support it, absolutely. But that's not where I can put my energy now. Okay? So there are some things that aren't discussed. And also, let me say that some feminists have tried very hard to be righteous and to listen to me because their real fear is the conservatives, the Christian conservatives are coming to get them. And I sit there and say, you know, some of my best friends are, and you know me, you know, you know me. And, uh, you know, let me tell you something. There's a bigger problem coming your way. They're going to put you in a burqa. You're going to be forced into a polygamous marriage against your will. That's bigger. I understand you don't like Christian conservatives. You're afraid of them. There's a bigger problem to focus on. <coughs> slowly, 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 there's some a grudging recognition. I don't know if that begins to answer your question. Does it? Yeah, it does. You know, we're, right, we're, yeah, yes. I oh, will wait. Let, yes, and then you right after. Uh, I'd just like to ask a question about Judith Butler. Judith Butler. Judith How can you Butler. understand a word she writes? Well, I do, because I, I know Judith Butler. Judith Butler is a, a Jewish, lesbian, anti-Zionist. Yeah. But what is the psychology, what is the mindset of a Jewish American, no, an American Jewish Lesbian and Are you writing this for something, or is this a burning no. question in your heart? It, it is. It is. It is. It is. I wrote an article 
to address your question. At the National Post the Canadian in Canada, Canadian. yes indeed. Yeah, the editor, Jonathan Kay, asked me to do that because he was puzzled. You know, let me, let me just say one thing. I don't know Judith Butler, so I'm not speaking about her personally. Even though it's very um, popular on campus, to be gay, lesbian, bi, sexual, transgender, right, very popular. These groups really are fragile and marginalized and are not representative of 90% of the population. So how are they gonna save their asses? How are they gonna be in like Flint? Well, they're gonna take popular positions, whether it's against their own interest as a woman or as a Jew, they're gonna take a popular position. This is the popular position the one that she's taken, that to criticize Israel is a right, a God-given right, and maybe it is, and um, that she is actually being the better Jew by doing so, and that those Jews who just blindly go along and accept anything that Israel does or says, they are the ones that are not the real Jews. The real Jews are the ones who put the, the feet to the fire of any Jewish state, and there's only one, there's only one Jewish state, and it's very tiny. So what are you writing down, so I have to know. <laughs> I have to know. Did this in any way enlighten or answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Yes. You, you put into question uh, the Jewish comfort level in the, in the eye of danger, which is where we live. Yes. Um, you mentioned Freud and a few other people, and it's years back though in history. But just as a comment, um, we're right after the Jewish holiday of Purim, and the Jews of Shushan Iran. prefer to live in Shushan in, in their level of comfort, knowing that there was a danger. Because, they, because it was, it's, I think it's based on their, in, in their, their inbred um, reliance on the fact that God's going to come and save us. And what happened is that I think at some point in time when they realized there's a decree and a date set and they're going to come and get us and that's it, be heading to, be heading to all of us, um, they saw the light. So this living in, the, in, in our comfort level is not a new concept. And I don't know how it can change today unless we get the intelligentsia, as they say, to figure it out and let everyone else know that it's a real thing. You know what, you don't figure listen. it out without the intelligence. Not listening. They don't listen. They don't, people don't listen to people. And they don't trust their own common sense. Well, this is a problem. Let, let me, she's talking about the Megillah of Esther and Shushan. The Jews of Iran may have come there after the Babylonian exile. And compared to Christian Europe at the height of the Inquisition, their lives weren't that terrible. Yes, there were some very, very wealthy Jews and many, many impoverished Jews. But Jews in the Muslim world were forced to or allowed to live very close in community with each other. They were allowed to practice their religion, which is all that mattered, community, family, religion, God. And yes, it's true, they were exiled. Yes, it's true, they were persecuted. Yes, they were massacred. Yes, they were taxed. But it's what they knew. And when the persecution became too great in history in Iran, they some Jews fled to Afghanistan. I have a chapter about that in the new book. So the thing is, people can't go about their lives with the awareness that we're on a narrow bridge between life and death, right? People need to think that the earth is very firm beneath our feet and what we're used to, we will always have. We did not think that we were gonna lose always earning more money, always having more jobs, always being able to send our children to college. Gone, it's gone. That whole notion of linear progress upward, gone. And here we are, we're not leaving America. We're not leaving America, where are we gonna go? The Jews in Israel, they're not leaving Israel, where are they gonna go? So, um, but, but I think 
it's interesting, we, we've just finished Purim and Passover is about to happen. It's too fast. It's too fast. Anyway, thank you for the question. Yes, right next to you. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I, okay. Yes, sir. Haskell Haddad, and I joined a committee, you know, for reparations for Iraqi Jews. Um, I came across a most interesting statistic. In 1980, the UN said that there were 1.5 million, quote, Palestinian refugees. And I put it in quotes because in the past, these were Egyptians or Syrians um, or Jordanians, really. There's no Palestine. But we were the Palestinians, the Jews. So in 1980, the UN, which has been funding the Palestinian terrorist authority from the get-go, said that there were 1.5 million Palestinian refugees. And that meant the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, anyone who once visited somebody you know, in Ramallah, they were included. In that same year, in 1980, there were five million Afghan refugees festering in camps, all people who were born in their country and remember living in their country. So there was a Soviet era, Arab League concerted, the day after Israel won the war of self-defense in 1967, the, what had been brewing anti-Zionist hatred in the Middle East became a well-oiled and well-funded campaign. And when Joan Peters published her book on that very subject of Arab uh, Jewish refugees, she was mocked and scorned and her data was challenged and questioned. So the Jews elect the Afghans. I mean, no one's paying attention and the fact that there was no, when Jews were exiled from Egypt or from Iraq, you had to leave quick and with $10 and you couldn't sell your property or your factories, you couldn't take your furniture or your jewelry and you were sent forth naked. And guess what? The Jewish state took everyone in and didn't come to the UN with a handout for money. So this is our reality. And I think that now perhaps if this is understood better, that's the ethnic cleansing, that's the Udenride of the Middle East. Uh, maybe on campuses even, it could be taught and understood and learned. Okay, it's an important point. This woman with the glasses. Yes. Um, the first thing, is, one comment and one question. The comment is, you, you, you said something to the effect of, we're losing the campuses. Well, I said we lost them. We we'll lost the campuses. Well, we didn't just lose them. I recently read a book um, called Nazism in the Ivory Tower. Do you know that book? Norwood. Nazism? Norwood. In the Stephen Norwood. I don't. Norwood. Phenomenal book. We never had the Ivory Tower. The right, kind of anti-Semitism that went on on the, like, um, the Ivy League campuses. That's what you really dealt with, the Ivy League campuses. In America? The Seven Sister Schools, yes. Uh, their support of Germany. Up until the outbreak of the war, yeah. was just yes. extraordinary, yeah. and I'm not sure how much they gave that up in the interregnum. It, yes. No, no, no. Go on. Go on. No, go, go ahead. Go. Go. No, don't go stop. Uh, my question is, as I recall, when I read your book, I read your uh, book right after it came out, and um, I 
think if I recall correctly, you discussed attending a feminist conference? Uh, it wasn't me. Uh, this was a conference that was to take place in Turkey, and they invited one Israeli Jew feminist to rep and she was disinvited. Is that the one? Or is it another one? Well, okay. I, I, I don't want that. I don't remember. But what oh, really I struck me, what really struck me was the hypocrisy. And, and this is what I don't really understand. The hypocrisy that goes on at these feminist conferences. All they want to discuss is Israel. They don't want to discuss oh. issues like genital mutilation, honor killings, and all, I mean, buying young girls in places like Bangladesh, bringing them back to Saudi Arabia, and using them as sexual slaves. This and this, they don't discuss. Only Israel. That's the demon of the world, and everything would be perfect if Israel didn't exist. Let me tell you, if they didn't have that outlet, that uh, escape valve, things would really be bad for them. I can't, I wish I could disagree with you. I would like to. Um, I'm going to become the token feminist of my generation who spoke the truth in this area. Uh, there's a kind of a madness, a virus let loose in the academy. It is a madness. It's a, it's a pathology. So Bruce Bowell, when he was researching his latest book, he called me weeping from a Women's Studies Association meeting, saying that they were laughing about a woman being beheaded. And I said, Bruce, get a grip. Maybe they're really nervous about such a thing. And he said, no, no. And then they mocked you. I said, it's OK. And you'll work on honor killing. It doesn't exist. It's not important. And then I got quiet, and I was very sad. So that what began as something that I helped pioneer has degenerated, as the rest of the academy has, into you have to be a person of color, preferably left-handed, definitely vegetarian, with, uh, very with a Stalinist point of view. Uh, it's better yet if you come from <laughs> Thailand and if you're a lesbian activist. All these things are required de la uh, to pass as significant. It's a madness. It's a madness. I only hope it will pass suddenly. And then it'll be as if in a dream. Did it really happen? You know, did they really do that? But there's such hypocrisy. They don't really seem to. As feminists, they don't. Well, no, no. See. They're, They're multicultural the relativists. Of women. You know, you see, yes. They're well. They want to have their funding sources and their tenure and their friendship circles kept intact. They don't want to risk it. And like like anti-feminist academic men, it's the same thing. And. Um, the hypocrisy is, the des is their desertion of universal human rights. So even if we can't rescue a woman in Pakistan or in Afghanistan at this moment or in Saudi Arabia, we can at least speak the truth about her situation and what it means in the light of American values. But if they're multiculturally relativist, and that's courtesy of the anthropology discipline, right, then, you know, de cannibals are equal. All cultures are equivalent, equal. So can I ask you a question? I want to ask no. You a question. <laughs> so two quick questions. One on multiculturalism, which I wrote down, and the other one on, on what's happening in the US. So I want to challenge you on multiculturalism. Go ahead. Because right. as a Canadian, where we argue that multiculturalism really began, the whole idea of multiculturalism was recognition of group rights, and that the policy was about integrating the other recognizing the other, oh, yeah. integrating the other economically, socially, and culturally. There's a public sphere, a private sphere. So in the public sphere, people who migrate to a democracy to Canada are allowed to practice some of their customs and culture as they're integrated. And some things are for the private sphere. In your temple, in your home, you can't do certain things in public, but you can do it in your temple, you can do it in your house. And there's certain things, like honor killing, which is against democratic principles in a multicultural society, and you're not allowed to do it. And I, I would submit to you. It's against the law. Exactly. And, and there's other practices, other cultural, in quotations, practices that are illegal in Canada in this multicultural society. So I would submit to you that Canada, 
has been much stronger than the United States, which is the melting pot model of native multiculturalism or integration, than the United States. Because I would argue that Canadians are more aware of the importance of citizenship in a multicultural democratic society. So I think there's different forms of multiculturalism, some which defend democratic principles and citizenship, like women's rights and gay rights and cultural pluralism. And there's others that are kind of relativists all over the place, which I think you're referring to. Do you agree with that or disagree with that? I'm oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, thank God for Homer Ardermont, who defeated the Sharia law possibility in Canada. So if you commit a crime, yes, here's the problem. As an American, I believe in individual rights. I believe that an individual should have the opportunity to progress in advance. I'm not so certain about letting someone advance, progress, uh, because they're a member of a group and they're not qualified and they're not interested and maybe they're barbarians, okay? So I don't know whether that exactly touches on what you're after. Okay, we, we do want to, America is the place filled with immigrants. We're an immigrant culture, country. We're made up of immigrants. And that still is true. But here, it's, for better or worse, we believe in the right to, what's the exact phrase? The pursuit of, of happiness. It's not granted, it's not guaranteed, it's not a government handout. America may be moving closer to Canada and to Europe, but I don't think that's good. I don't think it's good. Okay, and then one more quick point. Read Salim Mansour, okay. I if you haven't, I have. on, on the multicultural, uh, the delectable lie. Okay, and one more point. Chuck Hagel was just, um, ah. Obama nominated him despite the warnings of many in the Jewish community and others. Charles, could you speak louder? Yeah, so yeah. Chuck Hagel has just been appointed secretary. Uh, Our secretary. war secretary. He, despite the fact that the Jewish community gay community and other lobbies, other groups were protesting to Obama and his administration before the appointment officially was announced and he was recently appointed the other day. The whole discourse of due loyalty and the Jewish lobby came from, and I'm choosing my words carefully, I'm not being flippant, it came from Reverend Wright's church. It came from the discourse of the African American community, a part of the African American community that's prevalent in Chicago, like the Nation of Islam, like Reverend Wright and others, and up here, uh, Leonard Jeffries and other people. That this discourse of Jewish power and due loyalty is alive and well. Obama comes from there. And my problem is not with Chuck Hagel, my problem is with Obama, that he took this nomination. And for the last several weeks, this discourse is not only in mainstream American news and intellectual discussion, it's also being beamed in the part of the world that you discussed in which these horrible genocidal anti-Semitic stereotypes are mainstream, i.e. in the Muslim world. And the, the, the image that this discourse has had on the Islamic world, I think is very important and shouldn't be underestimated. And we were speaking earlier the comments of the Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan yesterday in Austria at the uh, UN Civilizational uh, Conference, where he, in the same breath, said that Zionism, fascism, anti-Semitism ought to be a crime of uh, and, Islamophobia. Uh, and Islamophobia ought to be a crime against humanity. And tomorrow, Kerry is meeting with him. No protests, no discussion. What is happening? What is happening to mainstream, forget the campuses, what is, the United States, as a Canadian, a guy living in Europe and Israel, the United States at its best was a place where human rights was at least upheld, at least in rhetoric. What is happening and why the silence, why the silence? Across the board, not just within the Jewish community or amongst the other, why the silence in your I, opinion? I think that the indoctrination is complete what I call the Palestinianization of intellectual reality is at the UN, is in the American government, is to some small extent in the American military, 
human rights organizations, international organizations, feminist organizations have all drunk the Kool-Aid. So, but I also think something else. I think that there are many people who don't know what hit us and who are just trying to earn a living and make a mortgage payment and take their kids to and from school. And they're not warriors. They're not in an army. And the old, see, Obama can get people to turn out to protest. That's Saul Alinsky tactics. He's got them. It's in, we don't have um, a group or a funded group to do that, to be an army of truth tellers and of protesters and of resistors, just what I was talking about. So I think that what's happening is happening so quickly and people are either deflated by it or frightened by it or not clear enough about it, about what, I mean, I just on the way over here, I said to my friends and guests, um, I just read briefly that my president is not going to be sending the USS Abraham Lincoln, a Navy ship, where it's needed to protect my country because of the Republicans and sequestration. This is crazy. This is crazy. But it is also what's happening. So what is it that we, the little persons, can do about it? This is almost like Eric Kafka territory. This is almost... George Orwell, Aldous Huxley territory. How do we, in mass totalitarianism culture that's beginning to have a heavy footprint in America, of all places, the last country standing, how do we resist it? How? Because there's no place else to go, folks. So oh, that's front row, my There won't be and any country to the last escape country. to if you know, America is If America is literate. taken over by, so, shall we say it, dark forces of people. Yes. And we're individual all right, yes. Who is it that we are resisting? Is this all in other words, who makes who's fixing the cool? Who are we supposed to be opposing? I I thought what you said about it all started with Arafat. Wow, did he pull the wall over the world's eyes. But what is it now? Not he what was. makes the Arab so attractive to the world? And the Israeli, well, who for we, years was the hero in the Ari in, in exit. What happened? Well, remember the global battle against apartheid in South Africa, which united so many people for so long, and then that battle presumably was won, and the level of violence in South Africa is among the highest in the world now, alas. Um, where were all the people who want to be the good people, to change the world, to save the world, going to go after that battle was over? Okay, they took the apartheid, anti-apartheid movement and focused on Israel with the same earnest fervor and the same righteousness um, but again, I have to be, people are frightened, think of journalists um, and professors, just to start with, and those who work for human rights organizations and those who work for the United Nations. They have to toe the party line or it's gulag time. This is where we are. This is where we've been. Now this is, so back to the Shushan question, we're here, we're not leaving. It is the last best country standing. We do have to wage the fight here on American soil. Yes. And I think people are blown away. I think people are not yet ready. And also, who do you who who do you fight? Every article that tells a big law, you fight against it. You expose it. You don't print um, it. Uh huh. I write lots of letters. That's good. Print them. They don't print your letters? No. <laughs> Send them to me. So, that, so we, we have, we're over time and we're very strict on time. So, oh. one more question. So All right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to. Quick question, please. We got to wrap up. Sorry. Uh, two years ago, I went to a JCPA meeting and discovered the sad. A what meeting? Jewish Council of Public Affairs, uh -huh. JCPA. Okay. And discovered the sad state of. 
Jewish organizations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my question to you is, why are we in this situation where Jewish organizations that I used to give money to on a regular basis every time I got a letter in the mail, and I no longer do, are so clueless and so useless in this uh, difficult time? Charles, can you stop answering that question and I'll join you? <laughs> that question, that question. Oh. People fight with me when I start to criticize Jewish organizations. They, they say I'm no longer a liberal in good standing, I've become a terrible conservative, an arch fiend conservative. Um, and that to be, to be Jewish means to fit in, to go along, to get along, to uh, make people feel good, to feel good oneself, to assimilate into the larger culture, whatever that may be, uh, not to make a fuss, to keep your head down. I mean, it's that shot still. It's partly that, and it's partly they're okay. What's your problem? I mean, when I had my first meetings with the organized American Jewish establishment, I was really amazed because they said they're okay. They have like very big salaries and a very good pension plan, and they're flying in three-piece suits to uh, the capitals all over the Arab world. What's my problem? They're okay. So they confused the business at hand, which is to keep themselves in business by whatever means possible, with, oh, there's a real clear and present danger facing the Jews, Israel, Western civilization, America. They didn't get to that part. They're OK. They're trying very hard to be OK. But Charles, add, add to that. So I, I agree. I think, so I think growing up in Canada and living in Europe and Israel, you know, the United States, at some level, it, it's a tough country. Because if I think if you lose your position, you're in serious trouble in Canada, Western Europe, and Israel for better or worse. About the, you know, you get unemployment for a year. You get 70% of your salary for a year. There's networks here. You're out of a job. You don't have health care, and you're you're out of pay. I think that's a part people have to live in fear of losing their position. And if you're a scholar, and if you're working in the community, and if you're a professional, donating to the being you know active in the in the community. You have to have relations in your profession and in your organization to survive and to continue on. I'm I'll say also, I'm amazed, I'm here 10 years, I'm amazed at the power of authority. You know, you, if you get a picture with the right people, if you get connections to the right people and you're in with the right people, if you're invited to the right meetings and the right offices and the right the president's office and get acknowledged from you by that type of authority is extraordinarily powerful. And I'm amazed at how scared people are to criticize constructively uh, a poet. And I have to say that if, if the president of the United States if he was the prime minister, the prime minister of Canada goes, as in Europe and northern Israel, they go in front of the parliament eight, nine months a year, and five days a week, they stand up in front of the opposition, they lay out their policy, and they're grilled every day during question period. If you lie in parliament, or you mislead parliament, or you don't answer the question, you could lose your position. Here, Bob Woodward, what's going on in oh, this country amazing. now, amazing. if you are lucky as a journalist to go to a press conference, and you ask a difficult question, there's a very good chance you'll not come back. And, and, and your career is affected. Th these are very powerful things. And it's time, it's, time that, it's time that scholars, it's time that real leaders of human rights organizations and Jewish organizations stand up and be respectful, but be critical and demand the answers. How is it, how is it possible that the head of military intelligence of the United States, for example, in front of Congress can say that the Muslim Brotherhood is secular 
and, and not violent. <laughs> How is it? It, 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 it's, it? It's not funny. Oh, well, it, it's not funny. And these people are not stupid. How is it possible? How is it possible that these relations are, are developing in front of everybody? It's, you know, the, you know, the, it, it, it's astounding. And the, the people who criticize are marginalized. The people who are critical are labeled and dismissed. And if this is a free, the freest, best country in the world, where is the discourse? Where is the intelligent arguments and debate? It's, it's a, I find it amazing. Living in Israel, you know, you go in an academic environment, or you read the media, people debate. They debate all the time. They argue. They can remain friends, but they argue, debate, politics, ideas all the time. Here, people take it personal. And you're labeled personal. It's time to discuss ideas and to debate, to debate them. So uh, when yes, I when yes. I'm, I'm going on no, no, around, good, when, good. when people when I give talks to the Jewish community or, or other communities, one of the, I always start with questions: How many people have read the Hamas Charter? How many people have read the intellectual founders of the Muslim Brotherhood? And it's a tiny fraction of the people who care about the issues who actually sit and read this. We have to read it. Some of, after you read it, some of you will say, well, we have to go to war with them. Some will say, we have to engage them. Some will say, they're benevolent, they're wonderful. And then we, but we can have an informed debate. And maybe after an informed debate, come up with some sort of approach to deal with it. But we don't, we don't, we don't even read What I've it. seen in the last 12 years is instead of the debate, I agree with Charles, instead of a debate, you, you have an idea that's not the right kind of idea, and then you're personally demonized and ostracized and shunned, together with your idea, and then you need to express your idea only to those other people in a ghetto who already have that idea. You don't have, and the debates, by the way, are not fair. The debates are stacked. You have people coming to Intelligence Squared, for example, where uh, recently, the so-called settlements were debated with Danny Dayan and, Mel and Carolyn Glick. And you have people coming to howl, hyena style, already ready. <laughs> they don't want to have an open mind. They don't come with open minds. They come to do fascist brown shirting. That's what they come to do. So that even where you think that there is a debate, or Brooklyn College, my colleague Alan Dershow would say it would be OK if only they let him also speak. No because people wouldn't come to hear Alan. And those who would come to hear him for, uh, already agree with him on Israel. What's the point? Nobody else from the student body would then be energized to be there, or, or certainly would be mandated to be there. So I agree with you. There is no longer a free exchange of ideas in the freest country on earth. We live in a moment where France, France has gone to Mali. I mean, this is shameful. And America is pulling back. And, and by the way, I'm not saying, therefore, all things need to be settled with blood and treasure being expended, because America has done a lot of that and has not gotten any of the credit for doing it and for trying to export freedom. Um, but there is no longer a free and open and honest public debate of ideas that are crucial to our survival. That is gone. We don't have that now. Am I the only one who's thinking of Nazi Germany? No. The, this no. latest best-selling <laughs> book, The no, Garden no. of the Beast, is telling us every day what no, happened. No, no, I already wrote about it in 2001 and 2002. So, yes. So, I'm sorry, we, we have to leave the room, so I'm going to have to cut it. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah, they're strict here. So, Phyllis, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.